Welcome to yet another session of Introduction to World Literature. Today we will be reading the short story Everyday Use written by Alice Walker. Now Alice Walker, she is an American writer and activist, uh, born in 1944 in Georgia in the US. Uh, she attended the Spelman College Atlanta and Sarah Lawrence College in New York. She was very much influenced by Martin Luther King Jr. And under this influence, she became an activist in the civil rights movement. Uh, during her college dates itself, uh, she was uh, into writing and some of her popular works include Once, which is her first collection of poetry, uh, in, which was published in 1968. Her first novel is The Third Life of Grange Copeland, 1970. And other popular works include In Love and Trouble, Stories of Black Women. Arguably, her most popular wor work will be uh, the novel The Color Purple, which came out in 1982. And for this particular novel, she won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. And uh, she has written a very popular collection of essays in search of her mother's gardens, womanist prose. And it is in this particular work that she coined the term womanist. And she defines a womanist as a black feminist or a feminist of color. And according to her, a womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. Now, why she coins this particular concept, womanism, is that she felt that, you know, feminism mostly dealt with the issues faced by white women. And through womanism, she is trying to bring to visibility the problems faced by black women and also to counter the kind of stereotypes that was being represented about these uh, black women. So to shatter those stereotypes and giving voice to them and bringing their issues to the light was what she purported to do when she coined this concept of womanism. She was also, after her graduation, uh, she has been an active participant uh, in welfare department of the New York City. She has also worked for the advancement of the black people in Mississippi region. So today we will be reading and discussing her short story, Everyday Use. And this particular story is from the collection In Love and Trouble, Stories of Black Women, which came out in 1973. Now this story is set in the early 1970s in the American South. There are three principal characters, a mother, uh, who is referred to in the story as Mama and her two daughters, Dee and Maggie. So the entire story deals with a day's event, what happens in a day when the elder daughter Dee comes home to visit her mother and younger sister and what happens during this particular day. Uh, the entire story is narrated from the point of view of Mama and she is an uneducated black woman and uh, she describes th this day's event uh, from uh, her point of view. Now, to talk about the two daughters, D is the elder one. She is the one who has been highly educated uh, and uh, she has gone to school with the funds raised both by her mother as well as by the church. And uh, she is a very confident, strong spirited girl. And compared to her younger sibling, uh, D is a better look or good looking girl. On the other hand, Maggie is not as educated as D. She is not as confident as, she, as uh, D. And uh, she is very shy, she is timid, but she loves her family so much and she works like a lame animal. Uh, she is not as good looking as D. She has scars on her body uh, from uh, a burning incident when, her, when their home was burnt down. And uh, there is another minor, minor character also appearing in the story and that is Hakima Barber who is uh, D's friend. Through the conflict of the perceptions or the points of view of these two characters, the mother and the daughter D. Walker is trying to present us with a question of what it means to truly understand and embrace one's culture and one's heritage. Now we will go to the plot overview of the story. As the story opens, we find uh, Mama and Maggie getting ready to welcome Dee. They are preparing the home and uh, Mama s uh, begins giving us a description of herself as well as of both daughters. So she imagines uh, about this popular uh, night, uh, tonight show uh, hosted by Johnny Carson and she has a dream what if um, it was D, her daughter who was the guest on this particular TV show and if she had to make an appearance on this show would there be this happy union of a mother and daughter happening and then she realizes that she is nothing like the people who appear on a television screen and this is her description about herself from the story I read. Uh, in real life I am a large big boned woman with rough man working hands. In the winter I wear flannel night gowns to bed and overall bed and overalls during the day. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day breaking ice to get water for washing. But of course all this does not show on television. I am the way my daughter would want me to be, a hundred pounds lighter, my skin like an uncooked barley pancake, 
my hair glistens in the hot bright lights Joni Carson has much to do to keep up with my quick and witty tongue so this contrast between how she would have to look like if she has to appear on a TV show like this along with her daughter and the way she actually looks like uh, brings in the contrast between the stereotypical representation of a black woman and uh, what she the kind of uh, inhibition that she feels in front of her educated daughter D because in front of her daughter she feels she is not as good looking and she may not be presentable on a television show but remember she does not feel apologetic at all about her looks she is quite confident and happy about the fact that she has a very strong um, body and she can work like a man because she is the sole breadwinner of this family moving on um, she continues her recollections and one specific memory that she has about her family is the incident of their old house being burnt down and this particular memory is, uh, has a very important uh, role to play in the narrative because you get to see a stark contrast between the two daughters Dee and Maggie through this particular incident the description is uh, like this in the story Sometimes I can still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her dress falling off her in little black peppery flakes. And D, I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree, a look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy grey board of the house fall in toward the red hot brick chimney. I would wanted to ask her, why, do, why don't you dance? around the ashes she had hated the house that much there are two different responses to this particular incident from Maggie and D Maggie was completely shattered and she was scared about their old house being burned down on the other hand you find D absolutely happy with the fact that this old house had burned down so it is through it is through these kind of incidents or these anecdotes that mama tries to give us uh, mama presents to us uh, the contrast between these two daughters D is someone who is not very emotionally attached uh, to the family uh, uh, neither to her mother nor to her younger daughter uh, sorry uh, neither to her mother uh, nor to her sister whereas um, Maggie was the one who was emotionally attached to her mother and to her family as such to her home also and D on the other hand always tried to present herself as a uh, better woman because she was the one who received education so this is a description from the text D wanted nice things a yellow organdy dress to wear to her graduation from high school she was determined to stare down any disaster on in her efforts her eyelids would not flicker for minutes at a time often I fought off the temptation to shake her at 16 she had a style of her own and she knew what style was so she never tried to associate herself with anything that was remotely even remotely associated to her black uh, familial background she always wanted good things to happen to her she knew she was beautiful and she she had a style of herself on the other hand you see uh, mama as well as Maggie uh, there is a sense of inhibition or they are intimidated by the presence of uh, D nobody could even say a no to her she always made it a point that whatever she wanted in her life uh, would happen to her and all the and all those things would be good things too so it was her mother and the church that helped her go to um, school and later to college but uh, she made it a point that she does not want to even bring her friends home she doesn't want she didn't want anybody to get to know about her familial background she was quite embarrassed by the fact that she came up she she was from a uh, black family so these are the kind of descriptions uh, in the opening part of the story and now as we move to the second part of the story which is when D actually comes home so as D comes home from this particular visit we get to know that there is much of a transformation that has happened in D she comes home uh, and there is a friend who accompanies her we don't exactly know who this person is he might be her friend or his boyfriend or might be her husband because uh, her mother mama is even scared to ask her uh, who this person actually is and she is quite startled to see D because there is a change a complete transformation even in her appearance uh, she is wearing a very bright colored dress um, it is full of orange and yellow and her hairstyle is different she is wearing very big accessories and it reminds us of a African style so she is trying to emulate an African style in her dressing and in her appearance and way before greeting her mother and sister what she does is she forces them onto a on a chair and she immediately takes a picture of mother and Maggie sitting with the home also coming in the frame and it is only after taking this picture that she even um, thinks to or she plans to um, hug her and greet her and as her mother calls her D she says 
that she is no longer D and she has changed her name to Wangera, sorry, Wangero Livanika Kimanjo because she wanted to reject her slave name. So, through this actual coming uh, with the actual introduction of D into the story, we get to know we uh, this author tries to present us with certain hints and clues regarding what kind of a transformation is going on in D. She had gone to the city for education and she is now clearly under the influence of the popular black power movement and the black cultural nationalist movement that was at its high point during the early 70s. So, this is what she says when she meets her uh, mother. No, mama, she says, not D, Wangero Livanika Kimanjo. What happened to D, I wanted to know. She is dead. I could not bear it any longer being named after the people who oppress me. So, now that she is under the influence of uh, black cultural nationalism or the black power movement, which was of the uh, belief that uh, we have to go back to the African, uh, proper African heritage and culture. So, under the influence of uh, the black cultural nationalist movement and the black power movement, which was of the opinion or their ideology was that you have to revive your black heritage and go back to the roots and that is the way to react and resist the oppression by the whites. So, as a result of this, there was this popular uh, popular fashion of getting back to African culture not only in your dress, dressing and your sartorial coats, even by adopting what seemed to be African names. So, clearly D is also under this particular influence and that is why she believes that her she is named after the white people who oppressed her and she, she, therefore she wants to reject it. But it, it is her mother who tries to uh, remind her that it is she is not named after any white people rather she is named after her own aunt uh, who was Dissi and this aunt was named after their grandmother D. So, this is a name that runs in her family, but she is absolutely ignorant of this uh, fact and she considers uh, D as only as a white name. Now, again the difference is remember earlier from whatever mama has described in the story in the early part of the story we get to know that D is somebody who is never interested in her familial background in the black heritage or in her black roots. She was someone who always wanted to distance or detach herself from all these things, but once she comes back home she is all the more excited about her family and everything that is uh, attached to their black cultural heritage. So, inside the home she is excited to see everything, every piece of furniture and every piece of artifact that she finds in her home. She is eager to appreciate the cultural value of the furnitures and the utensils in the home and uh, she gets hold of a butter churner and a dasher and uh, she is quite happy of the fact that it was made, handmade or handcrafted by her uncle from a wood uh, that uh, from a tree that was right outside their home and then she is uh, quite excited to remember that. Uh, the bench that is there in near the dining table was actually made by her own father. So, when she appreciates all these things in, in her mind mama is thinking about how difficult it was for them to afford to buy a chair that they were forced to make uh, these pieces of furniture uh, on their own. But uh, unfortunately what happens here is D is not able to appreciate the personal memory that is attached to all these things rather she is only looking at the shallow cultural value uh, that she tries to impose on all these things. And this kind of excitement about uh, the artifacts and pieces of furniture in the home continues to the extent that she goes to her mother's room and gets hold of the quilts made by her grandmother from an old trunk box. This is one point where the shift in the story happens because till then you find uh, D being the strong positioned and the strong uh, voiced individualist person in the story and till then mama and Maggie are silence, silenced figures, they do not even dare to speak in front of uh, D, they are absolutely scared of her, they feel intimidated in front of her, but now at this point there is a shift in the power position and uh, when D gets hold of these quills, she expresses the wish to take these also back with her to her home in the city. So, her plan is to take the dasher so that it can become a, a curio or an artifact, a centerpiece for her table and she hopes to, uh, she wants the grandmother's quills so that she can also put this as display item in her home. This disappoints and this annoys mama very much because she had planned to give these two quills to the younger daughter Maggie because she is soon to get married. So, these quills might be of uh, use to uh, Maggie and there is no rhyme or logic according to mama in simply putting them as display pieces in a home. 
So, this kind of creates a conflict between the two. This time, unlike the previous times when she could get all the things that she wanted in her life, for the first time, Mama uh, rejects her wish and says that she forcefully takes the quills back and uh, wishes to give it to Maggie. And this is the conversation that happens uh, for the quilt. And Mangero says they are priceless. She is saying now furiously for she has a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed and in five years they would be in rags. Less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. Dee looked at me with hatred. You will just not understand. The point is in these quilts, these quilts. Well, what would you do with them? Hang them as if that was the only thing you could do with the quilts. Maggie, by now, was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound she made with her feet as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never win anything or have anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. Now, here we see the difference in attitude of both the daughters, Maggie and Dee. On the one hand, when Dee is trying to forcefully take these quilts to make it as a cultural artifact, as a display piece in her home, Maggie is able to realize the value of it. She knows that it's very, she, it is dear to her, but she is ready to give it to her because she knows how to quilt. Even without these uh, quilts, she can remember her grandmother because the art of quilting, which her grandmother taught to her Aunt D, that Aunt D has taught it to uh, Maggie. So she knows how to remember her grandmother even without uh, really needing those quilts. So this uh, disappoints D because it's for the first time that. She, uh, she doesn't get something that she actually wants and with this disappointment and anger she goes back and she remem she tries to remind them or tries to advise Maggie as well as mother to at least be politically aware, be conscious of what you actually are, be try to embrace your culture and heritage because you are absolutely unaware of all these things, you are not able to appreciate the culture and value of all the artifacts that is at home and she also tells Maggie to be a little more independent and uh, to be like her and that's how she leaves the home. Now coming to some of the uh, major themes that the story uh, puts across, uh, basically this story is Walker's response to cultural nationalism and black power movement of the 60s and 70s. Walker is quite critical of the rejection of immediate history and ancestry of the blacks and embracing a more abstract concept of African heritage. She believed that uh, talking about culture in a very shallow manner the way Dee does in this story does not really help much in uh, understanding uh, the immediate history because uh, yes it is true that they have a history of slavery but you cannot simply reject it. There is a kind of livelihood that these black women live and she is trying to give voice to that, that kind of a lifestyle which is uh, you know uh, that Mama and Maggie is living as opposed to the kind of very abstract concept of heritage and culture and cultural values that D is trying to embrace which, which does not have any kind of rootedness at all, it is more abstract. And in order to bring this idea home closer, uh, she uses the uh, metaphor of quilt which is a common metaphor that you find across all the stories or novels that Walker has written because usually she eludes this process of quilting as a basis of high art and also as a representation of female bonding because the pro this act of quilting was very uh, commonly practiced by black women and there is a sense of bonding that is formed just like the warp and weft of the quilt between these women. So, it is a, it is a representation of the sorority among the women of color and it represents much more than just a piece of cultural artifact. So, that idea is br brought across in this story with this uh, possession of the quilt. Who is who should be the right owner of the quilt and mama feels it should be Maggie because she is the one who will put it to everyday use because that is what exactly this quilt is made for. It is not just a cultural artifact, it also represents uh, the kind of bonding and it run uh, the kind of uh, memory that runs through one's family. Uh, the quilt in this story as you read it you will understand, uh, as you read it you will know, you will find that uh, the quilt is made from pieces of cloth that their grandmother actually wore. It also has pieces of their grandfather's shirts and a small piece from the uniform that he wore in the civil war. 
Mag Maggie is the one who knows all these things. Dee is absolutely ignorant of all these uh, details. She just knows that this is something that her grandmother has made of her own hands. It is just that handcraft value that she at attributes to it. Whereas Maggie is the one who has actually learnt the uh, art of quilting. So Mama believes that she is the rightful owner, and that is made not to be displayed as a cultural artifact, but to be actually put to everyday use. Now, when Mama is made as the narrator, Walker actually breaks the stereotypes about the uneducated black women and give them a voice. And in to a, if we extend this uh, argument further, it can also be considered as giving the black women and their oral tradition a literary continuity. It's also important to remember that this story is dedicated to your grandmama. That's how she dedicates the story, and this also indicates perhaps that. She is dedicating this story to those black women who may not be politically conscious or would not understand the higher ideals attached to the black movements, but are the true keepers of their culture and heritage. Now, in this critical response to the uh, fashion that was at its peak during the early 70s of uh, uh, you know following African styling in their dress as well as in hairstyle, there was also this pattern or a fashion of rejecting your uh, what seem to be like your slave names and uh, adopting African names and that particular fashion is also critiqued when she uh, gives uh, D the name Vangero Livanica and it is an acute criticism of this particular practice that is common among cultural nationalists who believed that giving up their names and taking up African ones will make them closer to their roots. So, here through this particular story we see how there is a, a juxtaposition of aesthetic value and everyday use that she uh, makes and to represent these two you have the two characters D on one side and Maggie on the other. D is someone who is completely detached from her family. There is no personal relationship or a personal attachment that she has to her family, her familial um, ancestry or heritage as such, but she is very idealistic when she talks about culture because probably because of her attachment to these cultural nationalist movement. And what we get to know from her uh, behavior in this story or the way she perceives things in the story is that her understanding of culture and heritage is quite shallow and superficial. On the other hand, there is Maggie who is more pragmatic, who really values her family and her family members. So, this realization comes to Mama towards the end. So, at the beginning of the story you see how Mama perceived that uh, you know Dee is the more spirited, the strong educated girl and she always had an upper hand in the family whereas Maggie was the mute, the silenced girl in the home whom you barely see anywhere, she dev never even speaks. Uh, so, this perception kind changes towards the end of the story when Mama is ab able to appreciate Maggie's understanding of culture and family ancestry and uh, she for the first time realizes that perhaps Maggie is the more mature and understanding girl rather than D, whose attempt to make grandma's quilt into a showpiece becomes is perceived as a disrespect to her ancestors. So, uh, for further reading of this particular story, uh, I have provided you with certain texts, uh, Barbara Christian's introduction to everyday use and uh, uh, David White's reading of everyday use, where there is a more elaborate discussion of how this uh, criticism of uh, uh, the shallow understanding of African American heritage uh, is discussed further and uh, the use of personal names and heritage in Afri uh, Alice Walker's everyday use is also an interesting read for further interesting insights into uh, this particular short story and I have also given a link uh, to know more about the black power movement. So, thank you.